Hello, everyone. Um, I'm seeing the numbers rising, so we're getting more participants with every second that passes. Welcome back or welcome to Watch Time Live if you're joining us for the first time now. A um, couple of ground rules. You can use the chat to interact with us um, to let us know where you're calling in from. But for the Q&A session, we'd like to uh, use you the Q&A function of Zoom. So that way we can better track um, the questions and can then decide who is going to be on and be prepared. And we will interact with you to be on screen once we pick your question. Um, right now, we have the honor to have Global Force with us, represented by Stephen Force, um, which is always a true luxury to spend time with him and talk about his creation. Uh, Robert Groebel and Stephen Forsay created Groebel Forsay in 2004, and I think it's safe to say that the Swiss watch industry owes them a great deal for having done so. They have not only become known for the extreme care devoted to finishing each individual component of their timepieces, but also for the total dedication to precision. And for me, which is also one of the reasons that we are having this discussion today for their countless initiatives to preserve watchmaking as a craftsmanship. Their latest project took, uh, and this is just an incredible number, 6,000 hours of work to complete. And today, Stephen Forsay will try to explain or summarize these 6,000 hours <laughs> in, in a little bit less than one. Um, and show us why the incredible handmade one literally is unique in the history of watchmaking. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today live from Mexico. Uh, first of all, congrats on being nominated once more at the Grand Prix 2020 with the handmade one. Um, I think you've already won four times in the past and on top of that you have received the Grand Prix twice. So. Um, it's safe to say that this is a strong contender for the November edition of the, this year's Grand Prix. Can you tell us a little bit more about the handmade one and what it actually took to create um, a watch by hand? Well, thank you. Uh, good uh, morning or evening to everybody. Uh, I'm, uh, as Roger mentioned, uh, live here from Mexico City where uh, there is an, there's another watch event going on. I won't uh, plug that now. But um, thanks very much to all those uh, logging on to uh, to uh, to this uh, uh, 2020 format of um, of watch uh, watch events. Um, as uh, as Roger mentioned, so the the handmade one, a uh, very important project for uh, Robert Grobel, myself, um, our team Grobel Forsey, and uh, and I think in in some ways you know for for watchmaking as well. The, the actual piece we can't actually show you today because it's, uh, as, again, as Roger mentioned, it's been shortlisted for the Grand Prix de Genève. And uh, so it's on currently touring on exhibition in Switzerland uh, as we speak. Uh, but uh, we've got uh, a couple of little surprises and hopefully some nice little uh, elements to, uh, to be able to share this uh, unique adventure with you. Um, if I can just mention on the title page, there was the QR. The, the QR leads to a, uh, a short film that we've uh, put together uh, at Global Forcey over the duration of the whole hand one project. And what's uh, it's great, it's a link to our YouTube channel uh, with a handmade one film. It's about 24 minutes and uh, it really gives a great uh, insight because it's actually the individual people who uh, actually talk about their experience and the project itself. So we invite you to, to look at that at your, your leisure. So the, the Handmade One project, as I mentioned, well, for Robert and myself as watchmakers, this is, uh, has been very much a return to the source and the roots of our um, profession as watchmakers. Robert uh, grew up in Alsace, on the, uh, close to the Swiss border. His father was a watchmaker, and so it was natural that he would go into watchmaking. And uh, he chose to go more into the watch uh, industry in Switzerland. And he was a prototypist, uh, making individual components and building prototype at uh, IWC in the late 80s. Uh, on my side, I grew up in the UK, close to London, went to watchmaking school in London in the 80s. 
uh, in the height of the, or the, the very trough of the electronic watch crisis. But my fascination was about the history of watchmaking, restoration, and uh, the antique side. So uh, I spent the first uh, five, six years of my career uh, restoring antique watches, making individual replacement parts. And uh, like Robert and uh, a number of our other contemporaries, we were fortunate at that time there was still uh, quite a number of, um, of uh, watchmaking school teachers who had practiced and were able to pass on to us uh, these handmaking skills. So that's, um, you know, so there was really um, the moment when with Robert, we thought, well, this could become a real project. The handmade one uh, was, uh, was a great moment. And of course, uh, a bit daunting because while we'd been, we've already at Global Force for nearly, you know, since, uh, since the launch in 2004, we've created 30 individual calibers. Um, they, we use modern technology and machines to make precision uh, raw parts. And then we focus on hand finishing and the other aspects of watchmaking to, to bring them together. Um, but Handmade One was going to be quite a different adventure. And it also came about partly through uh, Time Me Foundation, which we uh, created, was created in 2008 after two, three years of discussion between uh, Philippe Dufour, Robert, uh, myself, uh, Vianney Helter, and as a group of, uh, of independent watchmakers, we saw that we were losing these uh, traditional handmade skills. So we wanted to draw attention to that and try and put together uh, a uh, project and hopefully get support to be able to make sure we transmit these skills to future generations so that all those collectors out there will still be able to get their watches restored uh, with, uh, using uh, traditional techniques in the future. So what was interesting was a uh, time in foundation, Naissance du Montre, uh, the project took five, uh, almost six years to bring together. And when we were getting to the end, the... Uh, the student, Michel Boulanger, watchmaking school teacher from Paris, uh, actually um, built uh, this very first, uh, the very first Nissan student But the idea of the project was to share and uh, widen those skills to other people. And we saw in our team at Global Forcey that there were, there were several different people coming to us and saying, we'd like to join in such a project to get back to touching the metal, to actually machining, parts in a handmade way, finishing them again in handmade way, and to, to be actually build such a watch. And uh, so that gave us uh, the idea with Robert to say, well, you know, how far could we go? So what we needed to do was we needed to sit down and uh, actually define the criteria. What would it mean? You know, because of course today there is a lot of hand craftsmanship in high-end watchmaking at different levels. But to for our Handmade One project, so we finally managed to identify four criteria. And the four criteria were that any part of the watch, including the case, uh, would, was going to be handmade. It could not have any CNC, any computer-controlled uh, uh, assistance. So the maximum we allowed ourselves was electric motor to be able to actually turn a lathe or perhaps a, a cutting tool, a drill or a, a milling cutter on a jig borer. So that was, a, that was already a fairly tall order because it meant that we had to find ways to be able to actually uh, master all these different techniques. The second criteria we already had at Global Force it was in the hand finishing. So again, any of those parts which were handmade to qualify as handmade would need to be hand decorated. So obviously then we're talking about uh, a significant amount of hours, new techniques and so on for that. The third element is that uh, it should be, must be assembled just by one watchmaker. So that imposed its own set of challenges. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and the final fourth element was that to qualify finally as handmade, we needed to fix a bar. So where was the level gonna be? So we said that, well, it would need to be at least 90% handmade, counting numerically or in terms of the time uh, required to actually make the parts together uh, to be able to call it handmade. 
And so we, uh, we've calculated that. And uh, for handmade one here, we're at 95% handmade. And in fact, it's easier out of the 308 components of handmade one to tell you what, what we didn't make by hand. So we didn't make the uh, sapphire crystals in this one, uh, the case joints, the spring bars for the bracelet, for the strap, the band, uh, the jewels, and we didn't make the mainspring. So there's just five component types that we didn't make. And what's interesting is uh, also what is not in that list. So um, in the handmade one, um, the uh, important element that we might have uh, sort of overlooked there is the hairspring itself and the escapement balance wheel, the whole regulating organ, as we call that. And uh, so we'll, again, we'll come back to that in a moment, but that's also something we've managed to master in an artisanal format. So the time required to do this, well, if we imagine that, um, you know, there's uh, in a high end, uh, you know, a higher end uh, mechanical watch today, which is made in a certain volume, there is a lot of technology in there. It's, it's nothing to be uh, ashamed of, or it's just a fact. And we could say that um, there are perhaps, uh, you know, 10, 20, 50 hours machining, maybe. But um, when you look at hand making it, uh, to actually achieve the handmade one, as Roger mentioned in the introduction, we are talking about a total of 6,000 man hours to build the first piece. And so in there, we're looking at something which takes probably 600 times longer than if we were to make that in a more industrial or more series production approach. And inside there, so why does it take so long? Well, literally every single component must be individually made. And uh, perhaps there we can, uh, we've set something up, actually live feed, hopefully, with uh, the atelier. We've got uh, Michelle, uh, our communication head, who's uh, got a, a light box there. So I think, uh, Michelle, you're online. Can we perhaps switch over to uh, one of the components? Uh, and so we can, uh, we can share that with the, with the audience today. Hopefully. Well, <laughs> um, while, while, while Michelle's finding that. I, I right can't see it. They, but can, they can see you, Stephen. Okay. I, oh, there's a funny thing because I can only see myself. But uh, hang on a sec. So, so this is a. Um, why would that be? I wonder. Uh, if you click okay. the little box on the top right that looks. Yeah. Ah, now I've got it. Now I've got it. Go. Now I can see. Oh no, it's ah, it's when I talk. That's the problem, I guess. Is it? Uh, sorry. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, anyway, so um, so Michelle is uh, holding up there a um, a, a, a disc, uh, basically a bronze disc, and that is uh, one of the early stages making the balance wheel itself. So it's just got the initial uh, ring, which has been uh, machined out there. Uh, it's a balance wheel which we're looking at a twelve point six millimeter diameter there. So um, this is a very early stage. So machined completely uh, individually uh, on, the, uh, on a, a precision lathe, uh, Schoblin 70 lathe actually there, um, which uh, enables us to uh, attain very, very fine tolerances. So uh, that's that first stage. Um, one of the important things in the handmade project, as I mentioned, was it was going to be assembled by one watchmaker. But because we're talking about so many different disciplines in terms of mechanical watchmaking, um, it was going to be uh, an almost uh, unimaginable challenge But to pull all of that together to one person. Uh, so what we needed to do was also fix uh, a level for that. So we fixed that the, we had to have the precision for each individual component, uh, which would allow the, uh, the movement to be hand assembled by one watchmaker without turning it into a prototype where you have a to file and adjust and so forth. So um, to, there in the screen, we've got a kind of not stage two, because there are actually like uh, 15 different stages in making a balance wheel. But uh, here we've got uh, the balance wheel where there are little uh, drilled holes there, which are the pointed out uh, to enable the, then the, the machining of the arms. You can see the 
the arms of the four arms of the balance wheel being crossed out there. And uh, then we can uh, we can move on to uh, to uh, the next example where we're we're making good progress. One little detail is that uh, don't forget that here we've got uh, you know these pieces are individually made. All of these were failures on the road to uh, actually getting a good balance wheel. So you know there was a lot of a uh, lot of experimentation and know-how uh, needed to be acquired. So here we've got a stage quite, quite well advanced here. Um, the crossings almost, uh, almost opened out, the uh, exterior form of the balance wheel all in place there. And uh, then uh, I think we've got uh, the final stage we'll be able to see, or an almost uh, final stage. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, so all of these had an issue somewhere in making the, the balance wheel. So there we are. So so quite a quite a late stage there. Um, what's interesting in terms of that balance wheel? So if we talk figures a little bit, um, a, a machine made series production balance wheel, uh, which was made by by the best of the best, would weigh would have a, an out of balance of one hundred and thirty uh, micrograms when it uh, came off the machine. Um, what is interesting here in our handmade one project is by pursuing and persevering with this whole uh, adventure, we managed to get to a precision at about 185 uh, milligram micrograms uh, coming off the machine. Um, and uh, then, of course, from there, then we can uh, we've got uh, um, meantime adjusting screws, uh, weights which will be added to it, which you can see the, the drillings on the side there. Um, then it's going to be mounted onto the balance staff the, uh, itself, the uh, roller fitted, and then uh, for the poising. So actually in the poising at the end, we're going to be able to get a really excellent, we're going to be on a par um, which uh, of uh, our uh, global 4 c timepiece in our collection. So that's a, that's a little, uh, little insight to the balance wheel. Making a balance wheel, well, um, how long could it take? It was... Uh, it's something which actually uh, to do one in a week is uh, going to be a pretty tall order. So looking at uh, 40 hours machining and then because we, we needed to aim to have one good one, we actually started off with uh, several blanks uh, along the way. And then gradually as the process goes on, if you were lucky when you're hand making, you end up with maybe two or maybe three at the end. So the objective was to aim uh, to have over 800 components to be able to, from that, uh, build the first movement, which would be uh, needing 272 components, 308 in the, the total of the, the timepiece. So uh, other elements um, in there, uh, uh, for example, I think we've also got uh, on screen, we can pull up a pinion uh, from, the, from the gear train there. Uh, hopefully. So uh, there, the pinion, you, so you've got the idea from the size of the tweezers. So this is a, quite a fine uh, pair of tweezers that Michelle's got here. Um, we're looking at a, a gear train pinion, uh, which is probably about 1.5 millimeter diameter, if I remember off the top of my head. Uh, 12, I think 10, 12 uh, teeth or leaves to the pinion. And again, made piece by piece on a Schoblin lathe. So each individual pass of the cutter, for a pinion, it's not too bad, but uh, there are elements there when you're doing that on a, on a precision lathe, you've got an apparatus called a dividing head where you have to turn a, a worm wheel. And uh, that's the kind of operation which is uh, actually, it's a, real, uh, it's a real strain because uh, at any moment when you're turning it, if you lose concentration, then it's over because you won't have the right... Uh, division when you're cutting the teeth. Then, of course, uh, polished uh, leaves uh, with a uh, wood disc. Uh, the face is polished, all surface is polished uh, on that pinion. And the final pivoting, which is the actual to do the burnishing the pivots, finishing the pivots done uh, on uh, a bow lathe uh, individually, piece by piece. And then we can uh, perhaps look at uh, a gear wheel from, uh, from the handmade one here. So uh, there we've got a, the actual, the wheel, uh, which we can see there. So um, looks, you know, looks pretty much like a, another gear wheel could look from, uh, from a, uh, another, another watch movement. But there's a couple of details here. If you look at the, uh, the rim uh, where the teeth are, the rim itself is very fine. 
Now, when we're making wheels in series, um, when you're stamping out the five uh, crossings, the five arms, um, you need to have a certain amount of material. So it's very difficult to get that uh, the, the finesse of the, of the gear wheel rim itself that we can see here, which is, um, which is a nice detail. Then we can see we've got a, a diamond countersink to, to the center or to close to the center or on the hub of the wheel. And we've got, of course, as I mentioned, five arms. Well, five arms, two sides, uh, each, uh, each arm has four corners in there. And because these, were actually, these are actually machined out, like in the balance wheel, each one has to be finished by hand and then beveled by hand. Uh, so there are 40 internal corners on that. And we were discussing this again the other day with the team uh, before, I, before I left here. And um, it's uh, extremely difficult to make one gear wheel actually in, uh, in 20 hours. So maybe you could make two in a week if nothing goes wrong. Because when you're doing those 40 corners, if you open one corner out slightly too much, then you have to try and balance that up. And very quickly, you lose the, the symmetry of the wheel and it becomes, uh, it becomes scrap. And you just have to start again, which is uh, a really a strong word in the whole, uh, the whole project of Handmade One is let's start over. So there um, we've got, um, we've got uh, that, uh, the gear wheel. So the teeth again there, the teeth all individually uh, cut once again, um, which uh, again is, is quite a challenge because there you're looking at something like uh, perhaps 90 teeth, which you have to cut uh, one by one. Uh, and each pass of the cutter is something which takes you uh, a few minutes. Uh, and then to index and then move on to the to the next tooth space. Um, and so if we imagine uh, making a, a gear wheel, that's when we're looking at something which is it's hundreds of times, about 600 times longer to make one gear wheel than to by handmade techniques than if we were making that in a, a series production aspect. Another detail would be uh, something like uh, in the, the escape wheel, the escape wheels were made piece by piece. Also, all the teeth cut piece by piece, finished and, uh, and ground and polished uh, piece by piece. About, you're talking about one week per escape wheel, uh, the, the actual, just the wheel itself um, to make it. And then um, other elements. So what's also uh, interesting was uh, the diversity of components. So between making a, a screw, for handmade ones, so the screws were handmade individually, one by one. And this was actually a kind of torture for the team. Um, we had one guy who was making screws and it, you're looking at something like eight hours to make one screw because you turn it initially, then you have to thread it, and then you have to turn machine the head roughly, cut it off, turn it over, cut the slot, bevel the slot and everything, harden, temper, polish uh, and finish. And um, so, there are 23 different types of screw in the handmade one and a total of about 80, 80 over 80 screws to make. So again, a huge amount of, uh, of effort was required there, but essential for the, the whole process. Um, then, uh, so across the making, um, as we see uh, the, in the handmade one, so we've got, uh, we, here we've got a little slideshow which, which we go around, uh, just uh, giving some other little uh, views of the, uh, the different process. So we used the uh, raw um, nickel silver for the plates and bridges, which does not have a electroplated uh, treatment. There's no surface treatment to it. Um, so, but we've worked with uh, different finishes and there's some uh, remarkable details there, which pushed our team to the limit. Uh, we've polished the flanks of the contour of the bridges, for example. Um, we've got the uh, tourbillon bridge there in steel which is actually uh, in a, an elbow format, which has got polished flanks uh, as well, um, and uh, polished barrel, polished finish, the uh, polished surface where the screw holds it down. You know, all of these types of things, we're actually pushing the envelope even further than in our uh, main, you know, in our uh, a global 40 timepiece from our collection. So, with, uh, with this whole project, as I mentioned, so it was really important to have the precision there for the components so that 
they could be built uh, by the watchmaker without having to retouch everything because at the end of the day we wanted uh, we set ourselves with robert we set an objective for performance and precision uh, that it had to be uh, for a tourbillon it had to be within uh, the criteria that we would fix uh, for our other time pieces so then um, coming back perhaps to the uh, to the area of the the hairspring and the the balance system we saw the balance wheel talked about the escape wheel the lever itself in fact um, the levers were really quite a challenge to make it's not a big component um, and uh, we've been making our own escape levers for Grebel Forcey from the very beginning, but here to hand make that this was uh, this was taking the bar to another level. Um, so there, the hairspring story. Well, about ten years ago, with Robert, we were um, also you know we were pursuing our mission and our, our vision in terms of chronometric performance, but um, we wanted to. We realised that if we were going to push further from what we could achieve uh, with uh, our double tourbillon technique, which had a an amazing uh, record performance in the Concours de Chronometry in 2011, um, that we would need to unravel the mystery of the balance wheel system. And so um, we we thought, uh, well, could we perhaps find a way to master that? And so we took the decision to go from a raw bar, a raw billet of material, and actually see if we could put in place, invest in our own in-house uh, uh, hairspring manufacture. It took six, seven years. It took three years to to gather together the process. We were able to uh, interrogate and work with uh, some retired people uh, who had been working in hairspring manufacture. So we were able to document that process. Um, and then we had to build up a workshop for that. But not having the objective to seek to make uh, 1,000 or 100,000 hairsprings a year, we uh, set out with the idea to say, well, it needs to be a flexible system because we want to study the hairspring. So we need to be able to make different types. We need to, going from the, uh, the wire, which is about uh, 400, it's about uh, half a millimeter diameter, let's say. So we'd drawn this wire, which was enough wire to go uh, from La Chaux de Fonds to Geneva and back several times. So we had several hundred kilometers of this wire, which we would never be able to use it all. But from there, from that half a millimeter wire, then we have to go further to then uh, uh, draw that wire, roll that wire down uh, to get to a, a hairspring dimension, which is around three hundredths of a millimeter thick uh, and around one, uh, a little bit under one tenth of a millimeter high in section. So that wire is there. And then we have to roll the wire, uh, put it into a drum, heat treat it. And through the incredibly difficult thing is through all of those processes, we still didn't know whether the material would be good. And so it was actually, it's that golden moment when you actually get it in the watch, when it's counted, when it's actually starts to beat, to tick. That's the moment that you know if your hairspring material is actually good or not. And so we were really pleased that uh, we had good uh, results for the thermal coefficient, well within the, the top quality there. Uh, and in terms of timing performance for the for the handmade one, we actually had a really good result. So it's um it's been uh, that's been a long adventure in itself. And so what you can I think what you can understand is that uh, the disciplines between making screws, making a bridge, making a gear wheel, uh, a balance wheel, there were so many different elements that we created. Uh, we were able to bring together this expertise from the best people. Uh, most of them in in our workshop at Global Forcey, but also some people outside. And it's not something that we're ashamed to say. And so we've got this uh, Global Forcey family. The case was handmade in La Chaux de Fonds at our case makers, who still has this expertise. Um, and some of the parts were made by friends and uh, watchmaking colleagues uh, who who work uh, independently or in the on their in. The, different locations outside so the i think we can understand if, the, the if, challenge if was really to try jump and... in for a second because I, yeah of course i when i was listening to how you describe the the project you you quite often brought in um pushing boundaries pushing the team mm. um 
I wonder, and I will, I, I might, I might tell a little story after, uh, after my question is, what is it like to work for you on a project <laughs> like that? Because there is this balance with you being uh, envisioning these projects. And, and at the same time, we know that a project like this will require discipline like nothing before. At mm. the same time, mm -hmm. you are extremely approachable. And, and this is the, the, the story that, that stuck with me. Um, in one of the previous discussions, I told the audience that quite often, if you really want to know a brand, you need to go see the brand. And maybe it's just a little note on the blackboard. Maybe it's just how people walk through the offices, how they greet each other. And mm -hmm. we were fortunate enough um, to have a couple of readers at your manufacturer, which you insist on not having named manufacturer, <laughs> but that's a different story altogether. Yeah. Um, and for me, the most impressive part was watching you walk into the finishing department with the 18 employees you have and spending a lot of time just saying hello to everyone so mm. and this for me is is how do you how do you manage a project like that and what does it mean for the people involved mm. well of course um you know robert's uh, also a strong driving force and i think um you know, the, the Global Force the Adventure, which is very uh, unusual, um, is uh, is something that thanks to the common vision that Robert and I share. So, so Robert, uh, you know, in his, his role as, as chairman of, of Global Force is also uh, very strong, but also at the same time a watchmaker. So he's he's very strong in uh, in supporting the, the project side. Um, and, you know, I'm on a day to day basis in in the atelier, in the workshop. Uh, and so, you know, we have an interaction. And I think it's important to uh, to say that, you know, what we do is 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 different. It's unusual because um, we don't have an objective to, to set out to make as many watches as possible. But we the driving force is this research and development. It's all about pushing the envelope and i think one of the great things today and, and thanks for, for for mentioning it is that um is our team you know if you ask robert or, or myself it's often the the we're most proud of our team because these are the people we've been able to as two watchmakers um share our vision with them and uh, give them the freedom uh, a certain freedom to be able to advance and uh, push themselves further so it's that initial uh, there's that initial um support and motivation there but the people themselves we can't be behind them uh, the whole time with a whip you know pushing them um so it, it's a question of fixing objectives clearly and then uh, giving them the freedom and knowing they know that they can come and ask any question there is no such thing as a stupid question and so uh, it's the interaction and the team spirit um which come together to to make it uh, to make it happen and i think that's how um you know in the you know, in the world, we can, we can do remarkable things. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of it. It's about interaction, communication, uh, sharing um, know-how. And again, I refer back to the film because the, the film we put together, really, it, it's the people, you know, they, it's their words. So, so I can give you a little, a, a little snapshot now. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's also not being afraid to say that something's gone wrong. That it's not going how you want. That we need to uh, we need to uh, evolve. We need to uh, move with that. Um, you know these are these are elements which are which are important. And and how do you actually pick projects like that? And I think that's that's also something that always fascinates me about how you approach um, the whole decision making process on which project is going to be pursued which one isn't how is that come is that a team decision or is it really is it your vision together with 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 um robert yeah well, well i mean you know interestingly the handmade uh, project came about partly because people in our team were wanted to participate in in such a project so so it's something which uh, of course um you know um there are there are there are certain projects that we do which are long term. We don't always know when it's going to be finished. So there, it's a it's not it's not such an exact organized uh, um, you know uh, planning, if you like. 
uh, we know that there are different projects we work on and we have a number. We, you know, we might have easily 10, 10 or 12 projects which are in hand in the workshop off the top of my head. Yeah, it's certainly something like that. Um, and the, all these different projects advance at a slightly different stage. So the whole time it can be, uh, it can be very, very late uh, uh, that, um, you know, just before presenting something that we might decide that, no, we're not quite happy with this detail or that detail. Robert might say, no, the aesthetics, we need to refine some details. Um, something might come up and we'll decide not to launch it at that moment and it'll be uh, it'll be presented uh, later on so um, it's you know it's of course you need to have a certain organization and that's why we have our, our collection with uh, certain limited editions and uh, you know uh, because you need to you need to be able to organize uh, the work for 100 people and uh, and for them to be able to uh, each one to add and bring the, their maximum uh, maximum effort and uh, engagement and, and investment in time and energy, um, but um, but of course you know there, there's a hit list and it keeps getting longer unfortunately because it always takes a lot of time. You know each time you want to you have a no compromise approach as Robert and I have uh, you know we've set out uh, from the very first. Uh, double tour beyond 30 degree vision in 2004 um this this approach is something which uh, which is very challenging and i appreciate that you encouraged me with your one sentence that there are no stupid questions and i might add but there are inquisitive idiots um <laughs> but i might go there um i mean obviously having the watch as a statement of what it means to do something by hand having the knowledge transferred to your team by having done so is the other thing. But how do you actually preserve the knowledge? I mean, you, you have briefly mentioned that you're documenting it. How does one with, without a watchmaking background have to imagine that? Is it a book? Is it a, is it a file? Mm. Is it, mm. how does it look like? Well, of course, at the beginning, uh, you know, when you, uh, a specific technique is something uh, which is going to be, it's going to be in somebody's mind. So then uh, we can, today we can film it. You know, we, we did that with, uh, with Maison Stune Montre, uh, filmed uh, a lot of the techniques there. So this is, uh, this is a tool which we have today. Uh, certainly for Robert and myself, uh, when, we, when we began, um, our Bible was uh, George Daniel's watchmaking, which is a very well-thumbed edition. Um, but there, the written word you have to kind of uh, you know you, you sometimes you're missing certain elements because often these techniques which were documented um have been uh, you know were done using a certain type of material or, or there were different things which which don't exist anymore necessarily so sometimes we really need to rediscover those techniques so um ultimately yeah it's a, there's a, there's a huge work to to do document and archive that and the handmade one where we completed the first piece um, and uh, we hope to be able to complete another one uh, you know in the in the coming months uh, thanks to uh, what 2020 has uh, thrown at us in the way of challenges that's that's kind of uh, you know it's it's taken a bit more time but that's uh, that's the way it is isn't it how did the project because it's it's for me it, it occasionally sounds a bit like living in parallel universes where on one hand you have the handmade process on the other hand i do know that you've you've never you've always been transparent about how to use modern uh, manufacturing processes which is why I, I i will never forget you immediately starting with we are not a manufacturer hmm. um, <laughs> how did you yeah. witness this increased knowledge on handmade techniques affecting your employees for the other part of the job mm. what did change mm. well i mean it's uh, well as i say it's early days because we've uh, we've only been able to do the the exercise uh, on this uh, on these first uh, couple of pieces um so what we what we we believe strongly in the future that, of that that um there will be a small number of collectors who Want to support such a project, and uh, 
and, and want to accompany uh, us uh, with that. But certainly it's something where, you know, we could easily be thought to be completely crazy because you can you could make such, we could have made the same caliber using modern techniques much more easily. Um, but, um, but it wouldn't have been the same, you know, because it's about, uh, it's about safeguarding those techniques. And so, um, so we've done that first exercise. What we want to be able to do and we need to be able to do is to have more time uh, to, uh, for another person to make the, the escape lever, another person to make the escape wheel, etc. cetera. So to, to, cross, uh, to cross over and uh, really um, reinforce the, the skills and, uh, and widen the base of them, so not just dependent on one person. Um, but, um, but it also has, uh, as you say, it has some other benefits because um, it, could, it means that the, the different, uh, the, the mechanic, uh, you know, the, uh, the tool precision uh, micro mechanic who, who made some of the parts uh, with the movement uh, constructor himself. The, so when you bring all of those, uh, that, that crossover and exchange and uh, of the uh, of the different skills and techniques means that uh, everybody has been enriched uh, by the by the project. And how did the the manual work or the whole process of, of building something by hand impact the category of accuracy? That's something that I truly admire about Gruegel for say it is never l'art pour l'art or just for the sake of it, it always mm. is purpose driven. So for me, it is the very essence of, of meaningful old horlogerie, which might be contradictory, I, I don't know, but precision and accuracy has always been on top of your list on everything you've done. And how mm. did that impact the, the final result? Well, yeah, well, it, it, well, this was a huge challenge because it meant, uh, you know, if you're gonna hand make a watch in where well, we can, you know, and, um, very honored to have met and the, to have spent some time with George Daniels. Uh, and there he's one man, he called it a sort of one man factory at the time uh, that he, he made his components. And as he went along, he didn't need detailed drawings because he made the parts as they went along. If it was uh, one or two hundredths of a millimeter, then he could adapt as he went along. But uh, for, for the project, as you said, for Global Forcey, we wanted to to be able to get to a stage uh, where we could actually master these processes and push them to a new level. So this was a major challenge in terms of the handmade one project was to say uh, we want to, we're going to impose the same precision tolerances that we would have in uh, one of our calibers in in another creation, and so that's extremely difficult because if you're finishing uh, you're burnishing a, a, the pivot or, on a, a pinion for the movement and you're half a hundredth of a millimeter uh, still over the size, over the tolerance you would like to be, but it's perfect. This is a really, this is a really frustrating thing. So, you know, to be able to master those techniques and impose that precision uh, meant that uh, we, we needed to be able to really work uh, very, very carefully on that. And that's where the interaction between the different uh, actors in the project came in also um, for them to see, so maybe the first pivot, this first pinion, uh, as I mentioned that example. So then he would say to the machinist, he'd say, no, well, can you make me another one? But can you be just a, you know, half a hundredth of a millimeter closer to tolerance? So, you know, is that, there's this whole process and interaction of there. It's a, it's extremely, it's, it's, it's high wire uh, sort of uh, trapeze art in a way. And uh, definitely something that, you know, you could imagine that we were just completely crazy to, to think of doing such a thing when we have so much amazing technology there that we could do it uh, much more easily in a much more uh, repeatable uh, approach. Well, thank you so much for, for providing us these insight into what I think is probably one of the most interesting projects that we had this year and, and, and understanding how much it actually took for you and the team to, to come up with a solution like that is, is truly, truly inspiring and impressive. Um, I do know Thank that you. unfortunately I'm the only one on this call 
that is currently going to be able to see the watch in person. I was lucky enough to have seen it <laughs> in La Chautefonds and I could see yeah. it again in Zurich because it's coming yeah. right to my door. Yeah. Um, yeah, It's truly impressive and fingers crossed that the recognition this piece deserves will be mm. seen mid of November uh, in Geneva. Hopefully, I just got an invite for the ceremony, so I don't mm. know if that how okay. that's going to play. Well, yeah. Um, I think you have to go back to meet and greet clients. Um, we don't. We had some questions, but I'm getting signal that you have. We to... had, yeah. Hi, everybody. We had some questions, um, but uh, uh, we're, we unfortunately need to move on to pilot watches next. Uh, Stephen Forsey will be yeah. back, however. Um, Friday, 11 a.m. New York time, East Coast time. So you can ask all of your questions. Um, okay. uh, you can ask him yeah. all of your questions tomorrow. And, well, and perhaps we, we can carry those over. Yeah, that would be yes. great. Yeah, of course. And on behalf of Watch Time and the audience, uh, it's been an honor. Thank you so much for spending time with us and have a, an amazing day in Mexico. Thank you very much to everybody uh, in New York, uh, Zurich, around the world, uh, for everybody to, you know, to participate and uh, to watch time for having made this uh, possible to share a little bit of this uh, unusual adventure with Handmade One at Global Forcey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Minda, back to the studio. See you all at 15 minutes at Dive Watches. Bye, everybody.